because God doesn't give it to them. So they want to take it from somebody else. It's really, and I'll tell you one thing that I've noticed, and I believe this wholeheartedly. Ever since I answered the call to preach and ever since we started this church, Satan has wanted me out of it. <laughs> that I know for sure. I, I know it. I, I, I know it is, and whatever wily way he could figure it out, he's wanted it. Whatever wily way, you know. So it's just, it's interesting. We, who knows what the Lord's going to do, amen? But uh, we'll keep trusting him through it all. And my goal is not to have five uh, ordained pastors here. My goal is to send four of you out of here if you're going to be ordained. <laughs> I don't want you here. I want you out there starting churches, not sitting here, right? Council. Well, go preside in another city. They need you there. There's one here. Go there. Let's send you there. You know what I mean? It's like there's towns all over this state that have no pastors, but we'll have four here. That just sounds stupid to me. Yeah, and it's not even practical. Well, we can't let somebody have too much authority. Well, God has the authority. His book has the authority. The church has the authority, and it's invested that authority, some authority that the, God has given the pastor in that, and it's recognized by the church. It's a checks and balance system, and it works out just fine when everybody obeys God. Right. Yeah, yeah. Take too much upon yourself, Moses, seeing all the congregation is holy. Loser. That might be in the message. <laughs> yep, it didn't end well. All right, Acts chapter 3, let's go. Anyway, sometime I'll teach you through that. I don't know when, whenever the Lord leads, and I'll chase our visitors away. But anyway. Um, there ain't nothing I hate worse than sliminess, man. If you want to punch me in the face, just come straight forward and punch me in the face, man. I'd be making a good one. Don't try to punch me from behind. You silly little coward, you, man. I hate that. I, I can't stand that nonsense, man. I've had it happen forever. That's how Satan does it, too, man. It's always a sucker punch, right? It's never in front of you. Acts chapter 3. All right, well, let's get into something more positive, a crippled man. That doesn't sound very positive, but anyway, it will be when we're done here tonight. The healing of the crippled man here. Acts chapter 3. We are back in the book of Acts. How about that? We finally got through Acts chapter 2, and we're moving along. I don't know how long that took, but and how long this is going to take. I think this one's going to go a little faster, I think. Somebody said, yeah. I don't know. Oh, that's Natalie. Okay. Even Natalie doesn't believe it's going to go faster. That's, that's trouble. We're going to try to get through the first 11 verses, 10 verses, first 10, really. Yeah. And then we'll get the second half there. I've got some things I added in for you, a lot of things I've added in over here in my notes. But let's read here. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Now the Message Bible says, And I ain't got a nickel to my name. I can't help it. It just goes through my head now reading this. I ain't got a nickel to my name. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. It's terrible. I, I shouldn't have read that today. Man. I'm just reading it. I'm like, this is funny. And I just, it's like reading like a comic book. And I'm like, this is crazy. I don't have a nickel to my name. <laughs> it sounds like it. I have to do it with my best accent, too. I'm going to put these online. Andrew, we're doing videos of those. I'm definitely doing those. I, I Good. This is going to be great. I'm going to do mo <laughs> Moments from the Message by PC. <laughs> it's going to be great. You're going to love it. I guarantee it. It's going to be great. Sorry, Aaron. 
I just want people to see how absolutely foolish things can get with Bible versions. It's just crazy. Okay, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Father, Lord, please help us as we go through the scriptures tonight. Help us as we study this. Help us to rightly divide the word and and grow by the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 3, verse number 1 here. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. It's interesting to note at the ninth hour the things that happened in the scriptures. Okay, number one at the ninth hour uh, was when the late laborers were hired for the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20, verse number five. In the ninth hour, they were hired, right? Uh, Another one in Matthew 27 was the hour when our Lord Jesus cried out in anguish was the ninth hour. Then the hour when the lame man walked here we see here at the ninth hour. Then the hour when Cornelius saw his vision was the ninth hour. Right. So all those things happen in the Bible at that ninth hour. Interesting. You could study those things out yourself. But um, <clears throat> that would be, I believe, 3 o'clock our time, I believe. Yeah. Yep. And all the newer versions, that's what they say at 3 o'clock. They don't say the ninth hour. They take that out, and they say 3 o'clock. Yep. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked in alms. So we see here that that Peter is about ready to deal with them. Peter says to them, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. uh, I think it's important to note, though, that, uh, you know, we don't always have to meet the monetary needs of people. Uh, that are out in the world there that you're always going to have somebody that's going to monetarily want something from you uh, They they know they they've they've been able to scam churches long enough people They know how to just perfectly scam churches and get whatever they want to most of the time And the churches have these programs now and they're no longer They're not judicial that the churches aren't any longer. They're not wise in how they hand things out now feeding people Yes feed anyone who's hungry, right? But you know, giving them different things and handing them money and things like that is not what we should do. Uh, it's not wise to give total strangers that you don't know money. That's not a good habit to be in like that because you don't know what they're going to use it for. You don't know if it's drugs or, or whatever. So I'd be very careful about that in very select situations. Would I, would I do that? And Peter doesn't do that here. He doesn't give, them any, give him any money. It's not wrong to feed a man that is need in need, but handing money to people that are like that could be could be bad you know we as the children of god who've been called to preach the gospel and warn every man we we should give them the gospel that's what they need to hear more than anything you know they ought to have an interest in the gospel but so many today would rather throw money at something to fix it because in their minds that's compassion and sometimes it's compassion to let people fail to let people fall to let people sometimes that's compassion to do that to, that, that it's a kind thing to let them do that so they learn some things from that you know especially people that are like that they're you know one of the things about your generation or the younger guys that are like 20 years old or so uh, in their 20s and, and early 30s it, it seems like they were bailed out a lot of everything completely bailed out all the time if something happened they were bailed out of it they were never made to answer for anything so then when they grew up and got in the world and they found out hey guess what nobody's gonna bail you out of this you're gonna have to work your way out of this you're gonna have to take care of this right and it's it's a good lesson for young people as well that we teach our children that there's gonna come a time and we have to prepare them that there's gonna come, that we have to be careful with them not to give them not to uh, give them a way out too easy, but teach them through some things as they get older. Say, so, you know what? I can't get you out of this one. You're gonna have to learn through this. You're gonna have to pay this off. You're gonna have to work this off. You're gonna have to learn from that. 
Because if you don't, then you teach children all the time that you'll always bail them out every time. And that's not good. There's a time to help your children. There's a time when there's a need for that. There's a time to help others when there's a time to need for, uh, of need for that. I'm not saying that. There's a time of compassion and things like that. However, I think sometimes uh, people don't see that it can be compassion to teach them a lesson to as well. But anyway, it happened in the power of the, of the apostles here to heal this man. They had the power to do that. So that's exactly what they were going to do. They were going to heal him. It says he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered them, with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. You notice, though, he didn't run off into another direction. He didn't run away from the Lord after he got what he wanted. What did he do? He ran to God, right? That's right. He was grateful. He's like one of those, uh, the, one of the ten, right, or whatever it was, that, that the other nine left, right, and took off, and the one stayed, the one uh, praised God. This one is walking and leaping and praising God. He is thanking him. He is thanking God, and he is being around the apostles. He's, he's steadfast. I think it's important to see that, that, that he is, that his, his healing didn't just, was not just a temporal thing to him. He believed on the Lord and he wanted to follow him. I think sometimes people just want out of their trouble. They don't really want to follow God. There's sometimes that people that you'll find out there that they'll seek God when they're in trouble. And then when they get out of trouble, they won't be pay f- faithful to God. You ever seen, oh, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do this, 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 and this. Well, you better follow through with it. Amen. You better follow through with it. There are so many people that they don't do that, though. They're in trouble, and they cry out to God. How many times did the Israelites do that? They were in trouble. They cried out to God. God delivered them. In trouble, cried out to God. God delivered them. Finally, God said, you know what? I'm not going to deliver you anymore because I've delivered you these ten times, and what have you done every time I've done it? You've turned on me. Right? You know, it's important to understand that so many today would have their temporal needs met and leave their spiritual needs behind. But this man is able to walk and to leap and to praise God. He's happy for what the Lord has done in his life. He's pleased with that. And all the people saw him, it says, walking and praising God. We're going to get into this crippled man and the miracle here uh, of what took place with him. But uh, And then we're going to break it down and we're going to talk about apost- apostolic healing versus fake healers. We're going to look at those two things tonight here but all the people saw him the miracle left them wondering which was the point we're not going to get into that this week but next week this shows you that that was a sign do you understand all of these things were done to get people to look to jesus so these apostles could preach to them that's why all these signs and wonders were done that's why at the end times we're gonna they're gonna be full of false lying sign lying uh, signs and lying wonders, right? And that's gonna be to get people to look at the antichrist because they're gonna look at him. That's what they're gonna do. But here it was to look at Christ. It was to get them to hear the preaching. The temple was full of people. It was the ninth hour, right? Everybody was there. This man, everyone knew this man. I want you to think about this for a second. Your own life, please. This is how we take this book and and apply it to our lives. God took this man that was at that gate beautiful, that everyone knew was a crippled man. Everyone knew that that man was down and out. Everybody knew for 40 years that that man lived a destitute life. They knew it about him. What did God do? Saved him. He'll save the worst of sinners to bring himself the most glory and honor. Sometimes you see a case of somebody say, that person can never be saved, man. They're wicked as hell. They are awful. They hate God. They blaspheme his name. You mean like Paul? Like Manasseh? Like Rahab the harlot? Known to be a harlot? Known to be a wicked woman? Like the, the woman that had seven devils in her? Mary Magdalene, a former prostitute, right? 
all of these people, and you think, you see these cases. How about some of you have some relatives that you, you've done give up on them, haven't you? I know you have. You give up on them. I ain't gonna keep praying for them. They're not going to get saved. They're not going to get right with God. They're wicked. They're not going to get right with God. Oh, no. See, God gets the most glory when he saves people like that. Because it won't be a work of man. Everybody will know that God did a work in that man's life. Everybody will know that. You got brothers and you got sisters and you got family members. You got moms and dads. You got people in your life right now and you think, yeah, there ain't no hope for them. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. Just like God took that man that was a cripple, that was at that gate every day of his life. And he sat out there and everybody knew what he was. Everybody knew that man was just a mangled up mess. And he saved him and he, and he, and he healed him. How about Saul of Tarsus? who murdered and hurt the children of God and compelled them to blaspheme. He went out preaching against Christ and compelled people to blaspheme. Right? Right? Yeah. You see these people nowadays. You see some people out there. Some of you have family members. We see some people out there. We think, man, they're so wicked. They can't get saved. Oh, God will get glory if they get saved. You know what that'll do to people's lives when they see somebody like that? Right? You know, it's like, um, what did he say to him? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, Paul. But he was kicking, wasn't he? But he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, didn't he? And what did he say? What wilt thou have me to do? Hey, Lord, what do you want me to do? So you shouldn't give up on anybody. Especially the worst case. The worst case you know you shouldn't give up on. You should pray for that worst case you know. You should absolutely, oh, but they're blasphemers and they hate God and they're, they're evil. And, and no more evil than Manasseh who burned his own children alive and did incantations and, and, and hired sorcerers and hung around with wizards and whores and harlots and filled Jerusalem with innocent blood that he had shed, no worse than him. See, some of you people out there that, that he, that'll hear this, and some of us can get caught in this if we're not careful. We can get caught in this. You see these conspiracies. Oh, they're New World Order. They're this, they're that. Well, yeah. Well, you don't think, they get, you don't think Donald Trump could get saved? Oh, no, he's too far gone. Oh, why couldn't he? Why couldn't he? Why couldn't he? Oh, I'm not praying for those guys. They can't be saved. They're evil. They sacrifice babies. They do this and blah, 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 and this and that. I'm not saying him. I'm saying that's, that's what people say about different people and leaders, Barack Obama or any of, my, any of these people. Boy, I'm going to tell you what. God can get a hold of any one of them people. God's spirit can get a hold of any one of those people and knock them straight down on their knees and bring them to repentance and faith in Christ. And if he did, it would make the whole world turn, wouldn't it? And say, what happened to them? Right? So don't let your conspiracy theories trump your Bible believing. You see, all, there's people that they see all these politicians and everything, and they just want to call down, like, like Stephen Anderson, he just wants Barack Obama to die. Well, why? Well, because he don't know what a changed life is. He don't know what repentance is. He don't know what it means to be born again by the Spirit of God. That guy ain't never been saved. He don't know what that means. He don't know what that means to be saved. How do you know that? Because if you knew what it means to be saved, you, knew, you know that God can save anyone. That's why. You would know that God could save that sodomite that you hate and you want to burn in hell. Right? God will save them too. Like the Bible says, such as were some of you in the Corinthian church. Oh, now all those people were sanctified preachers. They were all wonder. They were saved from their birth. They weren't bad people at all. Well, Paul goes through a list of things that those people were. 
Now, I don't know if you know anything about Corinth, which probably not, but if you did, you would know it was like a, it was like a, a major city. And what happens in major cities? Everything. Everything. Idolatry, prostitutes, religious prostitutes, homosexuality, perversion. Everything <laughs> that we won't even get into. Everything. What's the point? The point is that Paul said, you know, you, 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 such as were some of you, all these things, but God saved you. Right? So there's somebody that's let their, their conspiracy theories trump their theology. And now they can't believe that any of these people can be saved. Oh, just pray for them to die. They can't be saved. Really, you ought to pray for him to get saved. You ought to pray for him to repent. That ought to be your prayer for them. All those people, the sodomites and all of them, you ought to pray for him to get saved. It's a sad thing when we can't, when we think we're too good to pray for people that need to be saved. God will save the most vile of men. He saved old swearing Jack Waller. He was a blasphemer. He was a wicked drunk out of that Sandy Creek area down there, right? He saved that man. He became, swearing Jack Waller became John Waller, the Baptist preacher that started many, many, many churches down that area. God gets glory when he does those miracles like that, when God saves people. God gets glory by that. The more drastic the situation, the more glorious the deliverance. So that you and I should take heart when our situations or circumstances become severe. That God is well able to meet our needs. The more severe the situation, the more grand the deliverance. That's how God's children ought to think all the way until their death. If they are facing a trial that is going to kill them, they ought to think, well, either God will get glory in taking me home or God will get glory in delivering me from this. Isn't that what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said? It's exactly what they said. In the trial that they were in, what did they say? Yeah, we are not careful. That's right. Our God will save us if he doesn't. If he doesn't deliver us, we ain't bowing. We ain't giving in. Why? Because they believed either way God would be glorified. And, either, and that's the way you, you and I have to look at things as well. The harder the thing is through sickness, through finances, health, depression, trouble of mind and body, whatever it may be, God is able to deliver us. God is able to heal. God is able to do that. And he delights and he glories in what seems to be impossible for men. God delights in that. God delights in delivering his children when it seems impossible to men. Do you understand that? He delights in that. Some of you may be facing a, a trial. I don't know where this money's going to come from. I don't know how this is going to get met. I don't know how this need is going to be taken care of. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I could ever have this. I don't know how this is going to be possible. But God delights in answering those prayers. Amen. That's, that's how God, God delights in that. Because it shows his hand that he is God. Just like... He delivered that man, that crippled man at that gate. And every, why? Because everybody would see it and they would know, well, that's God. Right? The Bible says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than. Some of you got situations right now and things that you want from God and you see you're not getting it right away. And, and you may think in your mind that these situations are becoming impossible. Well, for you, yes. I will grant you that your situations for you, humanly speaking, are impossible. Right? But not with God. They're not with him. With you, they are. Because they're designed for you to look to him. Not to yourself. And put away this fearful notion that there's something wrong or that, that, 
that you will be worse off if you trust God. No, you'll be better off if you trust God. Can I really trust God in this in this situation that I am in? Can I really trust God in this that I'm in? Or should I try to figure it out myself? Your figuring will get awful messed up. You ought to trust God. With all of your doubts, with all of your fears, practice faith. Trust God. He is well able to deliver you. Well able. All right. Let's move on here. The healing of the crippled man. That was a good pre-sermon. Now we'll get to the main one here. I don't even know if we'll get to the the healers ones. I'm not sure if we'll get that far. Maybe tonight. I don't know. Anyway, let's let's look at this crippled man here and the healing of him. Number one, note the crippled man. He was begging for alms or for pity or mercy, that means. Well, he didn't know that he was going to run across a gospel preacher that was going to show him God. He was going to show him Christ. He was going to show him how he could have the alms and what he really needed, the mercy that he requested and he needed. But this man, he was prepared for this event, wasn't he? He was lame from his birth. He had been begging at the place for years, and everyone knew him. This was the divine preparation that people might observe a mighty miracle and turn their attention to Christ. The intent of the miracle was to point to Christ. That's the intent. That is the intent of the miracle for you for, to point men to Christ, a reason to preach Christ, to create an opportunity, not for showing off or smacking people in the head like Benny Hinn or, or, or anything like that, right? Or showing off some false gift that's not there. No, it was to point men to Christ. Christ was preached when these, were, these miracles were done. It also shows us that God is in control of every individual's life. We have no control over our nationality, our family condition, our physical condition, or our economic condition. Really don't. There are some things that we can follow to be good stewards. But in the end, God is in control of it all. God can preserve a man's life or God can take it. Do you understand that? There's men that thought that they were going to die and lived many years later. That God preserved their life. And on paper, it's like, how in the world is that man even living? The doctors told my uncle, you're going you're gonna to die in like five years. you got five years to live. He lived 25 years. Yeah. Made a profession of faith at, at my grandma's funeral or my grandpa's funeral when I was preaching there. But, you know, it, it's interesting to me that here's, a, here's a, a man that couldn't control any of that, and neither can you and I. All of this is in God's sovereign hands, everything. All your wealth, all your finances, your bank account, your home, your life, your breath. It is all in God's hands. Do you understand that? So if you spent more, more time praying and less time worrying, you would be way better off. Pray to the one that holds life in his hands and holds the breath of man in his hands. Right? God has been known to defy doctors. <laughs> Many times over. Amen. He's been known to do that a, f a few times, hasn't he? Right here he does it. Do you think it's interesting that Luke the physician is writing this? I think it is. Luke is the one that wrote the book of Acts. Do you think it's interesting? I do. Luke is a physician. Yeah, and he is. Luke is amazed. You can see it in his writing as he's writing this. And the technical writing that he gives, and which I'll show you in a minute here. 
Anyway, so we see that, that God is in control. My part is to accept what God has given me and to serve him in that situation. Sometimes you can't control the environment that you're in or the situation you're in. Your duty is to serve God and be faithful where you are. Where you are. That's your duty before God. You can't control all the circumstances. Stop trying. You'll be at more peace when you stop trying to control every circumstance around you. Some of you think you have everything figured out for your life. And I encourage good stewardship, and I'm glad that some of you have that, and, and all of us should have that. But there's a point to where you can depend on that and not God. You have to be careful with that. You have to be careful with that, not to do that. Right? And you become fearful and worried. But you ought to depend on God. You can't control those things. You can be wise, and you ought to be. God has commanded you to be wise. Right? There's no excuse for being a sloppy steward. Right? Of our finances, of our health, of our minds, of whatever. Our bodies, whatever. We ought to be careful. Good stewards. God says that, right? That's a principle in Scripture that we ought to be. So that's true. But at the same time, I have to give it all up to God and say, Lord, it's your will. Note the characteristics of this healing, though. There, these are the marks of the apostolic gift of healing, okay? Paul talked about those signs and wonders that he had. This, truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought, he said, right? So that's important. Why is that important? Well, it's important because if this healing was done all the time and it was just a regular gift that everybody had and that you're going to have down through the centuries, then it wouldn't stand out. Right? If, if the 3,000 people at Pentecost were able to do these gifts, there wouldn't have been a sick person in the world anywhere probably. Would there have? Right? So it stands to reason that there were a set of men that God gifted to do that. His original ones that he sent out to do that mostly. And then Paul as one born out of due time. Right? And Stephen was one. Uh, he did many signs and wonders, the Bible says. Right? At his hands. But that was for a time. What? To preach a message to Israel. That's what the, that was what it was for. But note the characteristics of the healing. Um, note the, the, the things that Luke talked about, his feet and his ankle bones. Those are medical terms. Luke understood what he was writing. Luke understood very well what, what happened to that man. If you look at the language of it. You take, for instance, that language versus Peter's in his, in his epistle, and you'll see the difference in the writing. You know, and in the, in the gospel of Luke, you'll see a very detailed gospel in Luke. Right? Because why? Because a doctor wrote it. Yep. Right, exactly. Lame from his mother's womb, which is, right. Yeah, he's, he's being specific. You know, he's, his language is very specific. That's why when you read Luke, uh, um, also the birth of Christ, isn't it, Luke? He's very specific as well. In his turn, why? He's a doctor. So you could see the, uh, the, the penmanship. You could see that God used that, just like he used Peter to be very plain spoken. And Peter spoke more of trials and tribulations and heartaches. Why? Because he went through them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I want you to notice something about this healing in verse 7 and 8. The healing was instant and complete. It was instant and complete. In contrast with William Bronham, the most acclaimed Pentecostal healer, he would lay hands on sick people and tell them, you're healed, but you'll be sick for some time. That's not the type of healing that we find in the book of Acts. Right? So, and I'm going to get into that a little more specifically here. Um, the healing was observable in Acts 3.9 in contrast with John Wimber, who taught the apostle healing is for today, but said that he could only heal things like headaches. Well, a Cairo can help you heal a headache, right? Taking a nap can help you heal a headache. Drinking some water 
since most Americans walk around dehydrated? That was a plug for water. How come I looked at Dave? <laughs> yes. Anyway, most people do walk around dehydrated. They have a headache. They drink some water and they take an aspirin and like five minutes later it's it's the headache's gone, but it was the water that took away the headache, not the aspirin. They just needed no, seriously, they needed water. Rachel's like, I got a headache, but it ain't helping. <laughs> Look, I'll drink some coffee. Yeah, that'll help. Right, Dave? Amen. All right, anyway, I'll keep going. But um the healing was permanent. It was permanent healing. In contrast, as many of those that were healed at William Bronham uh, by he, William Bronham and then died soon after. He was the father of, William Bronham was the father of the Pentecostal movement, basically, of healing. Basically, modern-day Pentecostal healing. In that sense, and I'm going to talk about him a little bit. The same is true for Oral Ripoff, or Oral Roberts, if you like. Right? Same thing. He didn't really heal anybody. The healing was not done during a healing campaign either, by the way. In the book of Acts here, they didn't announce a healing campaign. John, did, Peter, John and Peter didn't walk up and say, okay, we're going to have a healing campaign out here at the temple today. That's, and faith healers can't say silver and gold have I none. Because they got a lot of it. They get a lot of it. They got nickels in their names. I'm reading it just like that when I read that, too. It's going to be great. It's going to be excellent. All right, let's talk about some apostolic healing, though, apostolic healing versus fake healers here from what we see. And I want to review some things that I went over with you probably three years ago maybe or so. But uh, it's just some notes that I had taken down, and I think it's important at this section of Scripture to kind of talk about that because there are so many people that, fall for this fake heal these fake healing campaigns not that they actually believe that people that they're being healed but others are being healed and things like that mostly now healing started with jesus as far as that goes i mean it started in the old testament but it, it, for the new testament jesus but i jesus said in john 5 36 but i have greater witness than that of john for the works which the father hath given me to finish the same works that i do bear witness of me that the father has sent me notice christ's healing was to call attention to apostate Israel, who were unbelieving and needed a sign. That was the purpose of it. Remember, the Jews seek a sign. Signs and wonders were what the Jews said they wanted, that they had to have to believe. And Christ healed to prove that he was the Messiah. He said in John chapter 10, verse number 37, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know, and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. He did it so they would believe. That's what the point was. The, these people that, these faith healers, these fake healers, they don't do that. They don't even mention Christ. It's all a, a show. It's like WWE. Literally. It is. Remember, the sign gifts were temporary. They were only for a specific purpose. God used Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and many of the prophets. Not all of them, but a select few to show the power of God and what he was doing. That he would do something new to Israel. in Israel. He would, he would raise up a prophet. Right? That's what he would do. What's that? Oh, yeah, they would, he, would raise, they would raise, he would raise up a prophet. John chapter 14, verse number 11. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Who is he speaking to? His apostles. If I had not done among them the works which none of the man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. Like Christ, the apostles did not do miracles as a pattern for other believers to imitate. They did miracles as signs of their apostleship. By the miracles, they proved that they were called of God to be apostles. 
Remember he said the signs of an apostle. That's what the point was. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you all in patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds, said Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And there, are sign, there were signs of an apostle. And those sign gifts were those signs, and, and a few select men had those that were closely aligned as an extension of temporary authority, and then it was over. We see sick people in the Bible afterwards, so we know that's true. Mark chapter 3, verse number 14, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. Special sign gifts given by Jesus, his power given to them to do what he had for them to do. The apostles laid the foundation of the church in Ephesians 2.20, and when they died, their sign gifts ceased because they were no longer needed. If the sign miracles were operative throughout the church age, they could not have been effective as apostolic sign gifts. They wouldn't even have been effective. Even in early churches, all Christians could not do the miracles. The only exceptions were a few men upon whom the apostles had laid their hands. There was no general miracle working experience among the first churches. If there had been, Paul could not have pointed to, the, to his miracle working ability as a special sign if everybody was doing it, right? If all could have performed miracles as a matter of course, the Christians at Joppa would not have called for Peter to come from Lydia, from Lydia and raise Dorcas from the dead. If they were all able to do that, why'd they call him? Peter's miracle that day was the sign of an apostle. We can't let the charismatics get away with their phony crusades and their phony miracles and their phony healing and tongues. And they don't have the gifts of the Spirit. They have a perverse spirit, another gospel, and let it be accursed. Amen. The Bible says, let him be accursed. They preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. I had one of those guys tell me, you better be careful. You're, you're, you, you're telling me my gifts are phony and you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I said, well, you're not the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I mean, you're not the Holy Ghost. It's pretty simple, yeah. And you're, you're, I said, if you got the gift of tongues, please tell me which language. Said it over and over, and, and they never answer. They won't tell me what language. All I want to know is what language. I said there were 17 at Pentecost. Which one do you speak? Yeah, angelic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now let's talk about some of these faith healers just to remind you that this is opposite of what we see here, that Peter was had that apostolic authority to heal. He had that power from God to heal, right? But let's look at uh, John Dowie. You ever heard of him? His daughter was severely burned and died because he refused to allow medical treatment. He was a faith healer. Oral Roberts, the March 1952 issue of his magazine, Healing Waters, had three great medical doctors on the cover bragging on Roberts, but this was exposed as a lie. They weren't real doctors. Pastor Carol Stiegel investigated Roberts' healing claims and found no change in anyone. A Toronto a doctor examined 32 people that were supposedly healed through Roberts' ministry and found no case of healing. At least one had died. At a healing meeting in Texas in 1950, a storm knocked the healing tent down and 50 people had to go to the hospital. Between 1951, that, didn't, that healing didn't work out too well there. <laughs> Somebody got ripped off at that tent meeting. I don't know what happened there. But. Between 1951 and 1959, five people died in Robert's healing meetings. In 1977, Roberts claimed God commanded him to build a hospital. And in 1980, he claimed he saw a 900-foot-tall Jesus who promised he would pay all the bills for the hospital and that it would be a success. But in 1989, the hospital closed because of debts. All right. Now, I'll stop there for a second because I just have to wonder what that guy was on when he saw a 900-foot-tall Jesus. That ain't the Jesus. And notice he said he saw a 900-foot-tall Jesus, but he didn't see this same Jesus. 
I don't know what he saw. But he was on something. You know, I stayed across the street in a in a hotel across the street from that from Oral Roberts University. Yeah, I was at a hotel right across the street from there. I saw it and I was like, hmm. Interesting. Oklahoma. I think I was in o- Oklahoma City? No. You were with me. Yeah. But it wasn't it was wasn't Oklahoma City, what? Tulsa, that's where it was, yeah. That's where it was, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is, yeah. Well, anyway, he was a ripoff. That's why I call him moral ripoff. I don't know what he was. He was on some kind of drugs. He had to be because nobody sees 900-foot tall things unless they're on drugs um, or possessed. <laughs> One of the two. Right? Yeah. Definitely possessed. Those charismatics are definitely possessed. They can't shake them spirits out of them. They'll try to come to a church like this, and, man, eventually that spirit will just come out. It'll come floating on them one day, man. They'll just be like, they'll be saying the weirdest things, acting weird. I've seen it. I've seen it since I pastored. Yeah, they do. Oh, that one guy, that one guy, Nick, man, that guy was insane. That guy got red in the face, and he just, like, he was sticking his finger in my face, and he was just going at, man, those charismatics. Oh, yeah. No, that was a different guy. That Nick wasn't, no, that wasn't Nicky Hall. <laughs> Little Nicky. No, that's a different guy. That's another man that got mad. There's there's quite a few. You just go down the list of charismatics. William Bronham, his healing campaigns in 1946 were the start of the modern Pentecostal healing revival. He claimed that an angel always stood by him and told him what to say. Okay, if that happens... Run. (laughs) God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. You shouldn't listen to things that come up to you and talk to you like that. He said an angel sat by him and gave him all the words. And I believe him. I believe him. I don't think he's lying to you. I think a devil stood by him and gave him all his words because he wasn't listening to this book. So what was he listening to? Another spirit. And if you want one, they'll speak to you like that. When this ain't enough, you're going to be in trouble. Ain't nothing to play with, man. There ain't no romance in that stuff. It's wicked as hell. That charismatic movement, all that stuff is wicked. There ain't nothing romantic about it at all. Rip the cover off that nonsense. There ain't nothing. It's a bunch of debauched wickedness. Vile to God. All right, he says here that uh, an angel stood by him and told him what to say. He said that he could distinguish types of sicknesses by, by, by vibrations in his hand. Hmm. We have the personal testimony of Alfred Pohl, a former Pentecostal who worked in one of Branham's crusades in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I met one of those once. Pohl prayed for the bedridden patients who were transported to the meeting as he declared all of them healed, but many died soon thereafter. A local newspaper checked on the reported healings and couldn't find one genuine case. Catherine Kuhlman, I think that's the whore that laid hands on Benny Hinn. Was he grave sucking? Okay. Yeah, she's a wicked woman. Yes, grave sucking. A surgeon, William Nolan, published the book of a doctor in search of a miracle about his attempt to find cases of people who were genuinely healed through Kuhlman's ministry. He did not find any such cases. Kurt Koch ex- examined 28 alleged healings that occurred under Kuhlman's ministry in Minneapolis. Go figure. But he (laughs) had to be Minneapolis. And it was a woman. No surprise. But he did not find even one clear case of healing from an organic disease. John Wimber. Wimber was the leader of the Vineyard Churches. 
Yeah. He conducted signs and wonders conferences and taught that every Christian should lay hands on the sick and heal them. At a conference in Indianapolis in 1990 that I attended, he said, not me, but David Cloud, that God had sent healing angels, but I did not see any healings of those who were in wheelchairs. After a Wimber crusade in England, five medical doctors found no genuine healings and called his ministry hypnosis. Now that I believe. And they would know they're doctors. That's right. They'd be able to look at that and say, I know what that is. In an interview with a magazine in Australia in 1990, Wimber said he could heal headaches, but that he did not have success with serious sickness. And an aspirin. Uh, Charles and Francis Hunter, they had a wide-reaching healing ministry and claimed that healing is promised by God and that every Christian can heal others. During one healing crusade in the Philippines, Francis Hunter had to go to the doctor for a sickness, and another time she had to be transported home in a wheelchair. Charles Hunter claimed that he could heal baldness, but he was bald until his death. That did not work well. That's almost like Adolf Hitler starting a race of blonde haired blue-eyed people. <laughs> and he's got black hair. I mean, and nobody killed him. <laughs> that is hypnosis right there. Yeah. Whew. Famous uh, evangelist A.A. A. Allen was arrested for drunk driving during a healing revival in 1955 and then, and then fled bail and refused to face his crime. He divorced his long-suffering wife in 1967. Three years later, he died alone in a cheap motel in San Francisco while his team was conducting a healing crusade in West Virginia. He was 59 years old and had destroyed his liver with his drunkenness. After famous eva healing evangelist Jack Coe died of polio in spite of his belief that God guaranteed healing, his wife published a series of articles exposing the fraud of key healing evangelists. So the Bible warns us in the end times of these false miracles at the end of the age. Every time the New Testament mentions miracles in the context of the end of the church age, it is always referring to false, demonic miracles. Jesus warned that false teachers would be so clever and convincing that they would deceive the very elect if possible. Matthew chapter 24, what does it say? Verse number 24, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For the mystery of iniquity. What does it say in, in 2 Thessalonians? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It doesn't say there's going to be a, a rise of Christians doing miracles. And it's going to be. It doesn't say that. No, it says there's going to be an army coming up. And it's the Antichrist. And what's it say here? It says for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What does Revelation 13 tell us? And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. I could go on and on with it, but I'm not going to. Go listen to the sermon, Bible Instructions for Divine Healing, that I did a long time ago. If you want to learn more about it and what the Bible says about healing for us in this time and instructions that we're given to be healed, what the Bible says in, in severe cases of sickness and things like that. Uh, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we know that there are cases in which God doesn't heal people. Right? First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 23, Tro Trophimus never was healed. And even Paul had the thorn in his flesh, was never healed. God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Timothy was sick, right? Yeah. Many were sick and not healed instantly, right? 
So the Bible shows us what that divine healing looks like and what fake healers are. And it's very dangerous because it's a distraction from the gospel. Right? You're going to see here the difference next week when we talk about it. Here's the difference. This miracle that was a true miracle is going to lead to the salvation of sinners and the ex exaltation of Christ. Those lead to death, destruction, ill-gotten gain, right, and wickedness. That's the difference. Peter's going to use it to preach. They use it for a sideshow, and they're not even healing anyone. They're deceiving people. And the Bible says that in the times that we live in, that's what's going to be here is that those deceptions that are going to come. So we have to be able to understand what the Bible says and believe God's word. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the word of truth. Help us to live by it. Lord, just sanctify our hearts, please. Bring us back safely on Sunday. Help us with the rest of the week to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.